Michael Scharf is the John Deaver Drinko Baker and Hotstedler Professor of Law and Director of the Frederick K. Cox International Law Center at Case Western Reserve University's School of Law. In 2005, Michael Scharf and the Public International Law and Policy Group, a non-governmental organization he co-founded, were nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize by six governments and the prosecutor of an international criminal tribunal for the work they've done to help the prosecution of major war criminals such as Slobodan Milosevic, Charles Taylor, and Saddam Hussein. During the elder Bush and Clinton administrations, Scharf served in the office of the legal advisor of the U.S. Department of State. Ladies and gentlemen, Michael Scharf. Thank you. Thank you, Leon. Well, welcome back. We're at the City Club of Cleveland. I am taking over for Roz Atkins for the next half hour. Uh, we are going to be covering about five issues. I will ask our panelists the questions, and then following their answers, uh, one or two will respond, and we'll open it up after each question for any uh, comments or questions from the audience. I was just noticing that we do have a tweet that says, why are we still talking about this? So in fact, we are going to be switching the focus now from the role of free speech and religion to the question about how free speech and other civil liberties have been diminished during the response in the years after 9-11. And so the first question for our panelists, and, and just to remind you who we have here, we have um, on the far end of the table, Scott Horton from Columbia Law School and editor of Harper's, uh, Steve Dettelbach in the middle, the US attorney for Northeast Ohio, and sitting directly next to me is Jamil Jaffer, a renowned human rights and civil liberties lawyer who directs the National Security Project of the ACLU. Uh, the first question then for our panel as we focus on this new topic is, how have civil liberties and free speech been affected by America's response to 9-11 and the war on terror? And I also want to have some historic comparisons. How different is this than other times where our national security has been threatened, like during World War I or during the Cold War? Scott, do you want to start us off? Well, I think it's important. I think this historical perspective is, is really significant. You could even go back to the time of the quasi-war with France and the Alien and Sedition Acts. So we've had certainly periods throughout our history where in times of crisis there was a pretty severe retrenchment of free speech rights. There was uh, op open efforts to uh, uh, preclude publications. There was the prosecution of people for uh, for exercising their free speech uh, in publications and in, and in public declarations. Um, uh, so we've had these waves that have gone back and forth. And the period World War One was a particularly serious period. Uh, in fact, it's a part of our history that. Historians don't like to recall and go back over in detail, but there was a tremendous amount of criminalization of free speech during that period. People who advocated against the war, pacifists, uh, were routinely arrested and put in prison, treated very, very roughly. And again, during the uh, the Cold War, I mean, certainly at the height of the, Mac uh, the McCarthy era, we had a pretty severe intimidation. So if we go back and compare the War on Terror period with that, it looks pretty mild. What, what's happened now has been, I think, much, much more subtle. Uh, I think the government has become much more effective, frankly, in the uh, in influencing media, media has also become much more corporatized. But we have the government, to some extent, has used the same techniques and tools uh, that private industry uses to influence media, and it's used them uh, very, very effectively. But also with the corporatization of our media, uh, we've seen a change in attitude. In fact, I think Steve Fager, when he was speaking this morning, mentioned that, and he sort of gave a litany of some of the problems we have. But I mean, certainly a large part of uh, the profession, they want to build good sources within the government, and there's a sort of Faustian pact that goes with that, uh, where they will report the news that their government sources want them to report without sometimes doing the sort of vetting and checking of that news uh, that's appropriate. And I think this has led to some real problems in the media, and it's made our media actually much less critical of the government than it has been certainly in recent times. Well, before we get to that particular question, I want to follow up with Jamil. Um, you heard Scott say that compared to other historic times, we haven't really lost our liberties to that great an extent. Do you think that 
the security risks now and, and in these other times justified the kinds of loss of free speech and civil liberties that we've seen, or has well, the government yeah. got so, too so, far? So first, I mean, I do think, I'm not sure that Scott would disagree with this, but I do think there's been a, a really dramatic constriction in, in individual liberties, civil liberties and, and, and human rights since 9-11. Since and I think that if you look solely at what happened inside the United States, it can seem like what's happened is much less uh, significant than what happened after or during past national security crises. But if you look at the kinds of policies that we instituted outside the United States on the basis of the threat inside, uh, it really is quite dramatic. I mean, we had, a, we, we had a, a, a torture program that was sanctioned at the highest levels of government. That's never happened before. We had a rendition program under which the United States kidnapped people in foreign countries and sent them to other countries to be tortured there. Um, and at the border, you know, we had this uh, initially a warrantless wiretapping program that was authorized by President Bush, and now a congressionally sanctioned warrantless wiretapping program under which Americans' international communications, emails and phone calls are routinely monitored. You know, this really is a pretty dramatic, a dramatic shift. I, I actually think that inside the United States, uh, Scott is definitely right that the changes are more subtle, and they're more subtle in the sense that they're less easy to see. Um, but even inside the United States, I think you have this kind of strange phenomenon going on where we know less and less about what the government is doing because there's more and more government secrecy. And at the same time, the government knows more and more about what we're doing because surveillance laws uh, and surveillance authorities are expanding so, uh, so rapidly. And I think that we haven't yet sorted out the, the full consequences of that change, but I think that they will be significant. Let me follow up by asking a question of Steve, and, and you can add uh, your own uh, insights as well, because I know you were not sort of... Not surprisingly, I'm not in complete agreement. <laughs> so, um, but my question here, Steve, is you had mentioned in the last hour um, the fact that uh, our president has given some pretty amazing speeches uh, on the road, uh, and several of them, I think, got him um, a Nobel Peace Prize uh, because of the kinds of aspirations that he was describing. But others will point out and, and look at the, the litany that um, we just heard from Jamil and say, you know what, if you look at it objectively, Obama hasn't changed anything that Bush was doing. It's, it's every bit just a continuum. What's your response to that? Uh, well, look, I worked, uh, have worked in the government uh, under, uh, uh, I think now, four different presidents of different parties. And uh, uh, I, I will tell you, there, there, it's important to be exact here. Uh, Jamil was talking about, and I think your question talked about, civil liberties and free speech, as if the two were sort of the same thing. Uh, there's a, a, a vigorous debate upon balancing uh, Fourth Amendment, Sixth Amendment, search, freedom from search and seizure, civil liberties with national security, and that's probably a three-day seminar that Jamil and I have already done several times and debated several times. The issue of free speech, however, I think is a little bit different. And I don't know that a persuasive case has been made to me uh, that First Amendment rights, rights of expression, rights to speak out, uh, have dramatically changed uh, from 1999 to, to 2011. Uh, and I do take issue a little bit with Jamil's comment that, you know, our government is more closed and more secret than ever. Uh, you know, and, and part of this, I think, uh, President Obama has done a jo good job of setting tone about open government, and, and part of it also has to do with technology. I mean, when I was a young lawyer, a uh, client wanted to know what had happened in a congressional hearing. I called up, oh, sure, it's, it's, uh, we have a transcript. Great, can you send it to me? No. How do you get it? You have to come to Washington and sit in the congressional hearing room and Xerox the thing yourself. Right now, somebody in Moscow who wants to know what happened on the Senate Banking Committee yesterday can click on a computer, can see the whole hearing. We have a FOIA dashboard where the ACLU can check every day how we're doing in responding to FOIA requests, what our numbers are, compare them to last year, compare them to next year. Are we going to agree on everything? No. But I haven't heard the case that our freedom of expression, uh, of speech, has been significantly diminished Scott, in the post-9-11. Can you make that case? 
I think it's I think it's a difficult case, and I don't think it's the focus of the civil liberties debate in the country right now. I mean, I think there there are a couple of prosecutions that have been launched against people for uploading, uh, in one case, uploading a, a, a YouTube video that advocated the values of Al Qaeda. So I'd say that's a sort of fringe area for free speech to begin with, and that's a sort of free speech that has not been historically recognized. What about by our this courts. whole um, new law, the material support for terrorism? law and how that's been used against lawyers even who want to give legal advice, which is a form of speech, to organizations that may be on a terrorist list, but they want to do it in a way to help them achieve peace and reconciliation and, and avoid terrorism. Yeah, I think the material support legislation is really one of the, one of the very troubling developments, the way it's uh, been applied and the way it's been used. In fact, I just step back and say, if we're looking at material support of terrorism using the government's criteria for it, then the largest material supporter of terrorism in the world today is the United States government uh, because of the situation in Pakistan, which has received more than $10 billion and aid voted by Congress, and we've just had the chairman of our Joint Chiefs of Staff say the Pakistani ISI, which is the major recipient of that aid, uh, is directing and fomenting Haqqani, a major terrorist organization, uh, which just shows the sort of absurd twists and turns this can take. No, I think Steve is right, though. If you're looking for the biggest changes, you know, you wouldn't, I don't think you'd look first at free speech. I think that free speech is held up relatively well, but I, I think that that's in part because of what's been going on on the surveillance side. I think that surveillance, in a way, is a form of soft censorship, right? It's not direct censorship. It doesn't, nobody tells anybody you can't say X or you can't say Y. Uh, but you don't have to. If, if the government is listening to every conversation or monitoring everything that goes on the internet, people are reluctant to visit websites that they might otherwise visit, say things they might otherwise say, participate in demonstrations that they might otherwise participate in. And you know, when, when you talk about something like that in a place like Cleveland, not everybody, uh, not everybody recognizes right away how significant this chilling effect actually is. But if you go to Detroit, you go to Detroit and you go to the Muslim communities in Detroit and you try to get people to talk about politics, you'll see very quickly uh, how this chilling effect actually works. And, and, you know, I think it starts on the margins and gradually it creeps inwards. And, and, and eventually, you know, people don't visit controversial websites. They're, they're afraid of visiting aljazeera.com or, or, or the Federalist Society because the government might be, you know, monitoring who goes to those places. I think that that's, you know, that's a form of uh, infringement of free speech that's much more subtle uh, and that, that, that will have the same kinds of consequences in the long run that direct restrictions would have had, uh, but, but, but in a much more kind of nuanced way. Stephen? Uh, just to, to talk to Scott's point about the material support statute, uh, I think this is one of those cases where uh, the age-old debate between how much discretion you're going to put in the hands of government actors comes into play. And I think people's position on that statute largely depends on how they view that. So if you look, and we in this district, my office has prosecuted material support cases. And my gut tells me is that most people would be very comfortable uh, uh, with the cases we've prosecuted, case involving individuals who were involved in a cell that was seeking to uh, actually uh, send resources abroad to kill American soldiers. Uh, but there are others who say, well, if you look at the statute and you read it the way a person could read it, not in a particular case, but in general, that it creates all these problems. Well, that was the question I think the Supreme Court resolved. And the Supreme Court resolved the question in favor of uh, supporting the definition in the statute and saying, hey, look, you know, we can deal with problematic cases as they come up, uh, but this is an important tool that we need to use. Well, let me put this question another way. Right after 9-11, I think all of us were very fearful. And Lynn Cheney, who was the vice president's wife and an NGO, published a list of American scholars and professors who they said were saying unpatriotic things. Now, that was then. This is now. It's been 10 years. Would you say the pendulum has swung back so that we're in a, a more um, open environment as far as free speech than back then? So uh, I think that's a great and important point to make. Uh, when 9-11 when, uh, happened, after 9-11, I was working on the Senate Judiciary Committee, and I was working for Senator Leahy. And we were involved in a very vigorous uh, discussion with the Department of Justice and Attorney General Ashcroft about where to draw these lines. One of the things that bothered me and continues to bother me about that time was the notion that we were attacking the, the speakers on the other side of these questions, oftentimes very personally, uh, for doing what I think 
uh, was their duty as American citizens to speak out against things they disagreed with. I mean, the, the role that the civil liberties community played after 9-11, I think, is in the highest tradition of American constitutional values. I think it is exactly what Madison and Jefferson would have wanted to occur. And so I think that, looking back on lessons learned, I think that rhetoric, that sort of personal attack rhetoric, is something that we have to be very, very careful about occurring again in this country. Now, well, free speech has uh, two sides to it. The government also has the ability to speak. Uh, Stephen, can you talk to us a little bit about the role of government speech in terms of the positive effects it can have on reconciliation? Yeah. Well, you mentioned uh, the, uh, the idea of uh, uh, the Arab and Muslim community in the United States, I think, feeling like they are uh, being unfairly uh, targeted and discriminated against. But that is not limited to uh, governmental actions. I think that there is a disturbing uh, uh, narrative amongst our citizenry along those lines. And I think that uh, we, and I as U.S. Attorney and then uh, the Department of Justice, has played an important role in denouncing that uh, and in reaching out to the Arab and Muslim community and in showing the rest of the community as a whole that these people who uh, we now view sort of uh, unfairly as the other. They're not the other. They are what we are as Americans. They are immigrants. They are uh, important members of our community. They contribute to society. And they are entitled to, uh, just like Jewish, Serbian, Irish, and Italian immigrants to this country, each and every right uh, that pertains to us as Americans. Uh, and I think sending that message is a very important role that government plays as speaker. And Scott, your response? I, I'm delighted to hear Steve say that, and I think it's important. But we, we have to go and look at some of, some of the other things the Department of Justice has done lately. I mean, for instance, we've had a lot of disclosures in the last few weeks about training materials used by the FBI uh, with, I just have to call it bigoted, that's all it is. I mean, slides going up saying uh, Islam is a violent religion. Uh, uh, and uh, talking about their uh, tendency towards violence and uh, uh, disloyalty to the United States and so forth. It's just completely outrageous. Uh, and, of course, we've had the director state that there's an investigation into that and the people who are involved are being removed. But we have to look at the fact, too, that the FBI, we hardly have Muslim agents. We hardly have Arab-speaking agents. There's a very, very severe shortfall of inclusion of this community, and that's something where I'd really like to see the Justice Department do more. Yes. And, and, and by the way, I think it, that, that's a good point. And uh, looking at the sort of, for those who didn't follow it, there are, have been now a few different trainings that have come out which were counterterrorism training. And looking at the PowerPoint slides, it appears that there were some things said in those trainings that were just wholly inappropriate. Uh, I guess in response to that, I would say, look, we are still a government of people. And uh, uh, people fall short of policy and aspiration. And I would ask you to look at the reaction to that, which is the day after that happened, the Attorney General, the Director of the FBI, and the Deputy Attorney General not only denounced it, they demanded, and we are conducting now, an, a review of every uh, one of those training materials. I think I was on a call just as recently as yesterday where we were talking about, okay, what are we going to do going forward to vet these things better so that those kinds of views don't get passed out? Because it's tremendously... You can, you can undo a lot of really hard, good work in relationship building with a couple of mistakes. But look, the reality is uh, the government I is never going to be uh, perfect. Well, well I, I, go ahead. I, I like Steve's answer to the, to the previous question. But, but uh, to be fair, I don't, I don't think it is just a matter of a couple of mistakes or people, not, people falling short of policy. It's, uh, you know, there, are, there are many other areas where, where the policies themselves are either discriminatory or have a, a, a hugely disproportional impact on Muslims. I'll just give you one example. We represent uh, 17 people in a challenge to the no-fly list, the, the, the list that, that the FBI and other agencies use to keep people off uh, airlines. And all of our clients are U.S. citizens. Uh, none of them have been charged with any crimes. Uh, they all tried to board flights and were told, you can't fly anymore. And uh, they try to find out why they can't fly anymore. They try to find out what, 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 uh, what allegations have been made against them because they want to answer those allegations. And nobody will tell them um, you know, what, what the evidence is against them or even what charges um, the government has in its, you know, in its secret files. And, and in fact, if they, uh, if, if, if they do manage to find somebody 
uh, who can talk about the no-fly list to them, the response that they get from, from those people in the FBI is that, uh, well, we can't confirm or deny that you are on the list at all. Now, obviously, they, they already know they're on the list because they show up at the airport and they're told they can't get on the flight. But there is no process under which you can, you can actually get yourself off the list if you're there by mistake. And that's not an issue of you know, people falling short of policy. It's, it's an issue of policies that don't take into account the very human costs of, 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 of um, you know, the, the, the human costs of, of, of the policies. And, and I think that's, uh, you know, that, that's, that's something that the administration has to be faulted Steve. for. So I, I think um, two points. One of them is that there is a process through which people can aggrieve their uh, uh, status with the uh, Department of Homeland Security. And by the way, I don't work for the Ho Department of Homeland Security. Uh, but the second point and the broader point is, again, we're not talking about uh, free speech and free expression here, but these broader civil liberties issues. And on those issues, uh, I think it's fair to say, well, I respect the role of the ACLU and the human rights community. They need to be vigilant that as a government official, uh, I have multiple different balancing obligations, one of which is to uh, engage in the business of protecting our community. Uh, and there are uh, individuals uh, who wake up every morning still uh, intent on doing us harm. Uh, so we have balancing right. obligations. And so the notion that somebody who is on the no-fly list or may be on the no-fly list can't find out why and what the status of the investigation is doesn't strike me as an initial matter as being so offensive. I, I don't know. It has, a, it has a very significant effect on people's lives, right? Just imagine in your own life if you were suddenly told you couldn't fly to visit your children across the country you could, or, or in, in the UK. Uh, you know, you can't, you can't fly for your job. One of our clients is a banker. Suddenly he doesn't have a profession anymore. And as for the process, they have gone through the process. The process looks like this. You file a letter with DHS. Uh, DHS, the Department of Homeland Security, writes back to you and they say, we have examined the no-fly list. To the extent that any changes were necessary, we have made those changes. Uh, that's all you get from DHS. And the only way to find out if you're off the list is to go back to the airport. Now, you're right, obviously, that some, there are people out there who want to do real harm to the country. And part of the role of law enforcement is to make sure that those people don't do harm. But I think that if these people, our clients, for example, are amongst those people, then you ought to arrest them when they arrive at the airport, not just notify them that they are but, under Well, suspicion. I don't think that this, look, I mean, we saw what happened with Mr. Abu Muttalib flying to Detroit and how roundly the government was criticized for him not being on the no-fly list. And what was the response? Oh, well, it wasn't developed, the information didn't get to the right place. Places it wasn't put together yet. I, again, I don't work for the Department of Homeland Security, but the standard for getting on an airplane with hundreds of other people is not the same as proof beyond a reasonable doubt uh, that subjects you to uh, the loss of your liberty after a trial. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I just don't think that we're going to come to an agreement on that fundamental disagreement uh, uh, on policy. But not that I don't respect right. the, the, the thought behind what you're saying, but when, it's, it, when you are on the line, for uh, protecting people. And remember, uh, people who seek to do our country harm have to be, uh, they have to win uh, or be right once, right? The, the law enforcement has to be right every single time. Uh, that is not an easy position to be in, and I think you have to respect some of the, 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 the tensions and balancing that goes with that. Let me take the last thing you said and, and bring it back into the focus of free speech, and that is, in this struggle against terrorism, there's a lot of aggressive actions that have to be taken, a lot of policies that have to be made on the fly, and a lot of mistakes that are made. Sometimes it seems as if secrecy laws are being used to protect the government from embarrassment more than sources and methods. Scott, do you have a comment on that? Well, I think this is a this is a huge problem. I mean, you know, certainly, I mean, this is one of the issues we started with here. I mean, you know, it's true that there's much more information available and readily accessible before. It's also true that there's much more, there are many more government secrets than there were before. Uh, and, and I think the government's attitude towards protecting these secrets is becoming harder and harder. And it really affects our rights, uh, our rights as citizens, it affects the media, it affects what gets reported, it affects books you read. I mean, I can think of now a pretty long list of books written usually by former agents of uh, the intelligence service, former FBI agent Ali Soufan. I've interviewed a lot of the people involved with them. Glenn, uh, uh, Glenn Carl's book, he's a 
fairly prominent CIA agent who was the case officer for one individual who's alleged to have been the mastermind for uh, Osama bin Laden's finances. Uh, he, he wrote a book about it. Forty percent of the book was censored. Uh, and we discover in the end what is being disguised. This person was seized and was held for eight and a half years, was, as Glenn Carl says, any reasonable person would, would think he was tortured. Uh, we now know that, uh, that three consecutive uh, CIA agents who were involved in dealing with this case concluded that, no, actually, he wasn't Osama bin Laden's finance mistake. That was the conclusion of the CIA analyst. Now, the reaction of the senior people at CIA was, well, we'll just appoint a new case officer over and over again. And then he was squirreled away in the black hole at Bagram for years and years, being held. Why? Because of concerns about embarrassment on his release. Uh, and the CIA censors this entire book so people aren't able to learn about their colossal mistake. Um, that affects us and, and our understanding, it's a, it's a clear effort to protect someone against embarrassment. There's really no national security basis for it, but you know, this is what the CIA Publications Review Board did. Uh, and I think we can cite dozens of other examples like this. This is a serious problem. So we've had 25 minutes, a lot of thought-provoking discussion. I want to open it up to the audience for the last five minutes, a couple of questions. Please do approach the microphones and go ahead. You have the first question if you'll. Oh, anybody? I hate to have dead air time here, but I really do want you guys to have your chance. In the last hour, everybody was fighting at the bit to talk, and here we go. Sir, your question. Going back a bit to the historical perspective, uh, it strikes me that, that the comparison to the other periods that were made, that, that the war on terror compares most to the Cold War in that Civil War, both world wars, there was a feeling of finiteness, that, that whatever limits there were on speech and civil liberties, the nation and everyone assumed that the war would one day end. The Cold War went on for 50 years, 60 years, something like that. The war on terrorism is at least 10 years in. And it seems that there is a greater risk then of these limitations such as they are becoming more institutionalized for law enforcement or the military. And I'd like to hear what the panel yeah, thinks so of that. Justice Rehnquist had frequently said that during the time of war, uh, quoting Cicero, the laws must be silent when the cannons are roaring. But if this is a 1984 Orwellian war without end, does that mean that we're going to be in a new normal forever. Well, I, I, taking the comparison that you made, I mean, I think on the First Amendment uh, axis, we do pretty well in comparison with the Cold War on First Amendment rights. Uh, the Cold War was a period uh, where people who lived through it or know people who lived through it remember. Uh, there were uh, blacklists. There was uh, uh, House and Senate hearings, uh, uh, which were really an affront to the First Amendment. Uh, and uh, while, while we certainly have had a push and pull about uh, secrecy and those kinds of civil liberties issues, I don't think we've gone uh, anywhere near uh, that part of our country's disturbing past this time around. And you both agree with that? Well, you know, I think, as we, I think we all agreed before, that the First Amendment, you know, has been less the battleground this time around than it was in, in the past. But I think if you look more broadly than that, it's certainly something to be worried about, that there are no obvious temporal, there's no obvious temporal limit to this war. There's no geographic limit to the war. You know, we just, uh, as everybody knows, the, 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 the government killed a U.S. citizen, targeted a U.S. citizen for death in Yemen last week. Um, you know, I think that makes clear that the war we're fighting is different from any war we fought in the past. Um, and I think that if you're talking about a war that is everywhere and that a war uh, and, and a war that's forever, um, you know, the the idea that we might suspend some liber civil liberties for the duration of the war, uh, or in the geographic locus of the war, you know, that idea is a lot less appealing now, or makes a lot less sense. I'm getting the sign that we're just about out of time, Scott. You get the last word. I just say the harshest criticism I hear of the forever war is consistently coming from people in the Pentagon. They tell me there's a reason for having narrowly defined wars. That's because we can say we won them. <laughs> and when the war is going on forever, we can't make that claim, which is demoralizing. It really has bad effects for us. So I think this is, uh, there are many, many problems that flow from this. Let me ask the audience to join me in thanking uh, Scott Horton, Steve Duddlebeck, and Samir Jaffer. 
For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org.